it's like, it's bigger than me. I'm nobody, you know? It's bigger than me. It's about this culture. It's about my family. It's about us making a mark, uh, you know, the American dream, right? Um, it was a family effort to build this restaurant. It's, fam it's family funded. I'm 100% owner. Um, I don't have like investors or partners. This is just me. My name is Jay Lee, chef and owner of No One, East Village. I'm Korean American and you're tuned in to Shoes Off. and uh, my family and I, we moved to uh, Jamaica, Queens. We moved to Long Island when I believe I was 13. Going to high school where, you know, I was really the, the, really the minority. Um, I, I didn't face bully, bullying like that, um, but definitely like side eyes and um, left out a little bit, but never really bullied, bullied me. I think growing up, like, you know, in high school is very clicky, but, um, you know, the jocks always stayed together, the black kids always stayed together, and then the Asian kids, like, the five of us, we, like, kind of stuck together a little bit, you know, that was, that was like, it, you know? Um, I would say my parents were definitely artistic people. Um, my mom, I mean, my mom in Korea, she was a assistant movie director, but her, she, she told me the name of her movie, and my dad was like, it, it flunked. But, um, but she was like in that field. And my dad, he dropped out and he just started apprenticing as a carpenter in Korea. But yeah, they're definitely, you know, good with their hands, they're crafty. Yeah, I would say my parents were pretty like supportive of me being creative. You know, art classes, you know, competitions. Well, I mean, one competition when I was like nine or 10, but yeah, they were, they were, they were you know, they definitely supported that. I didn't know I was illegal until I was like in middle school. I was like, Dad, what do you mean I can't get like a permit? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and then it was like, a, I remember it being like a sit down. I was like, hey, listen, so uh, you came here on a travel visa. Do you understand? I'm like, no, I don't understand. What are you talking about? Yeah, we're basically traveling forever. Until <laughs> I want to go home. I didn't get into too much trouble, but like I did, you know, oh, like in high school, I didn't get into many fights because in middle school, where I was kind of getting bullied, I would always fight and like defend myself. It was to the point where I was like fighting like every week. And then my dad, this was around the same time and my dad was like, hey, listen, so you're, you're fighting and you know, oh yeah, also your permit. Okay. No, we're, we're actually traveling right now and you don't want to get into trouble right now. So that's when I woke up and I'm like, all right, so I can't fight. All right, so, unless he's like, unless you want to like get deported, you know? You're making a serious mistake in church with her. I am American. You gotta work on your accent, Pablo. He would always like scare me like that, I guess. But it was it was true, like we, we weren't legal. So I had to clean up my act quick. A lot of it had to do with like uh, like racial discrimination. You know, kids are stupid, right? Like, even even the other day, like, when I was opening the restaurant, these, like, high school kids, like, young high school kids were, like, girls and, like, two like two girls and, like, one boy, they're walking by and they're, like, oh, ching chong, you know, walking by. And I'm just like, oh, these fucking kids, they're just idiots, man. Like, they don't, they, this, to them, this is the f funnest thing, you know? So, but in middle school, like, when I'm the same age and when they say, like, ching chong, I'm like, yo, what the fuck is this, you know? And I'll just, like, fight. I'm gonna call your father. And it'll be like, it, it won't be like fight to like knock him out, but it'll be like, like shove him, be like, say it to my face again. And you know, it's like standing up for myself. I was always proud of being like Korean. Like, I think it's because of my dad. Like every dinner he'll like, he'll, you know, it's like, it's like a lesson about Korean culture. 
but it's like it's not even like less than trying to like feed your information it's like he'll be like did you did you, you don't know you don't know kimchi 2000 you this is what's wrong with kids these days just because you're in america you don't know i'm like you know he'll say things like that i'm just like <laughs> what's going on so i didn't even have like room to even doubt you know i grew up thinking korean race was the greatest race on earth you know <laughs> but you know not anymore you know we're all like i'm proud to be korean i don't think we're the greatest race in the entire world but i'm very proud but um but yeah i mean i never once wished i was a different race or a different whatever when i started working in restaurants i was uh, 18 when i just it was actually my first day of college yeah so so i at, up until high school well towards the end of high school i lived in hicksville with my parents and I told my dad, I got into Hunter. I got into like three colleges, right? All right, dad, I wanna to go to Hunter, but I wanna move out. I don't wanna commute all the way from Long Island. He's like, well, if you do, like you have to, you should pay your own rent. And I was like, dad, I don't have a job. Like, I'm gonna get you a job. So in church, in our, in our Catholic church, uh, one of the guys was a owner of a Japanese ramen shop and on St. Mark's, we're uh, in East Village, like on First Avenue, between St. Mark's and Ninth. And um, yeah, he's like, all right, your first day is gonna be uh, tomorrow. And I was like, that's my first day of school, Dad. It's like, it is what it is, you know? So I started working like three, four days a week um, you know, while, while going to school. And it was like a crash, life crash course. In that, in that time, did I feel left behind? No, I felt ahead because a lot of because a lot of students, like kids in my age, like you know, I got plugged in with another Korean community in Hunter College, and they were still living at home. Like none of them really moved out. They were still they're all from like Queens or Brooklyn or so. I was ahead, you know. When you tell your friends and when you're 18, you're like, yeah, I gotta pay rent next month. You're like, what? You know. <laughs> But when you tell your friends like, hey, I'll buy you guys halal today, I got you. You know, $5, five dollars halal, they're like, yo, bro, thank you, man. Uh, when I was, when I started in college at the ramen shop, ramen satagaya, my, my job was, uh, I was a ramen cook, you know? I had to, like, I cooked noodles and I just, <laughs> that's all I did all night. I w I'd never cooked before, but I picked it up like this. Like, it just like made sense to me maybe two weeks in like it just made sense and um and i was like getting really good at it um all, all the all the cooks at the ramen shop they were all like uh international students so that's you know they come here with a travel uh, student visa and you can't work legally with the student visa so they have to get cash paying jobs so this ramen shop was paying cash plus tip so you know, I was able to work there because I was, I did, I, I wasn't, I wasn't able to work, you know, with getting paid as checks. So, and all the other cooks, same thing, you know. So, but they were all older than me. I was 18. They were all 28, 29, 30. You know, yeah. So I was the youngest kid by like far, and I was like just so good at it. It's so much strength. Like we had to bring up like boxes of like fresh noodles from downstairs. Like the guys would just bring up like three boxes. I would bring up like eight. I was I was so like strong too. I was just good at good at that job, you know. I mean, right now fear is a motivator because the you know the situation of the world right now in this pandemic, restaurants and bars are are about to close down everywhere, you know. There are restaurants closing every single day in New York City, permanently, not even just like temporarily, permanently. And I just opened my restaurant last November. And I was doing, you know, we were getting a lot of hype, we are getting a lot of following on a lot of media, a lot of exposure. And then we closed for a month from March 15th to April 15th. And then when we reopened, it's like we were not busy, you know? Um, now it's like, I put, I put all my savings into this project. My parents, you know, gave me money to, to open this restaurant. My brother.
brother gave me money to open this restaurant. Um, so I have to make, I'm gonna make this work, you know? It's like, cause if I don't, then the dreams that I had, you know, I may, I might lose that dream, you know? So in, in a big way, it is fear. Without getting too deep, like I'm, I'm Korean, my, I'm, we, we adapt. This is what we do, you know? Um, we adapt and we fight, we're fighters, we're warriors. So this is like, it's a bump in the road, a big bump in the road, but I'm very confident like I'm gonna make it through. So right now we're in East Village at my first ever restaurant uh, called No One. No One is the name of my hometown where I was born. So basically, no one is on the east side of Seoul, kind of like the East Village of New York. No one is really known for its nightlife culture. You know, they call it a whole for, you know, beer drinking spot. Um, a lot of fried chicken you'll find in the neighborhood, but it's also like right by, it's also surrounded by nature, a mountain right next to us. And, and no one where I used to go hiking with my grandma. So it's like a mix of nature and like nightlife. Kind of like, that's how I think of it. So I picked this neighborhood because, um, you know, there, there's a few reasons. The first reason is that um, I did a pop-up in East Village last year for six months at a bar called Black Emperor. And that's where I made a mark and, you know, the media took on and noticed me, you know. Uh, so East Village was always like, and actually East Village is where I started cooking in 2007. The ramen shop was, few blocks away from here. So for me to like come back to this neighborhood really felt like a full circle. Um, and it just felt organic and natural. And the second reason is um, East Village is really a good area because it's surrounded by like similar, like small business, you know, small businesses that specializes in its own, own thing. It's not, you, you won't really find like chain restaurants here. It's as much as you'll find it in like Union Square or things like that, or like K-Town or Times Square. It still has a lot of the old New York vibe and culture to it. So it felt good to me, you know, to represent Korea here. So I find my inspiration with New York, period. Um, but, the, but, the, but the beginning is always Korea, you know? Um, I always, my goal is to always like, take a Korean ingredient and to highlight it in a way that's, that's not really been done before, that makes sense in the New York culture. The iconic New York dishes, like when you think of like, to me at least, New York is such like a melting pot of all different cultures. So you look at each neighborhood and what they're known for. Like Harlem, I'm like, yo, that's a chopped cheese right there. I think of Jackson Heights, I think of a halal cart, Sammy's. I think of Flushing and I think of the kimbap spot, you know, um, on Northern Boulevard. Um, you know, so like each place, like, like I think of one dish that kind of represents and stands out. And then I think to myself, can I do something with that, something that's inspired by that dish that, that translates and that, that I can like kind of add a Korean ingredient to and introduce to the non-Koreans. What's that like? Ooh, that's really good. I, eat, I try to eat out at least once a week uh, in a neighborhood restaurant or somewhere else. And I get inspired by every other, every other chef because the, the amount of thinking that I do about my dishes, how I think, I just like go into this like, uh, it's a rabbit hole. I just go down and I just can't get back out sometimes. Different chefs do the same thing, you know, except they, they think slightly different. So when I eat someone's, when I eat a, a dish at a, another restaurant, like I could tell most of the time what the chef is thinking. And when I can't tell what the chef is thinking, that means that it, does, it doesn't resonate, you know, with me. Can't think of food as just food. I, I realized this when I started working, like cooking professionally. It's like every chef had a philosophy to their cooking. And I'm like, to me, back then, I'm like, philosophy, like, that was like my bodybuilding mindset. I'm like, you need protein, fat, and carbs. That's it. Maybe some vegetables, maybe some fiber. But like, that's all, that's all it was to me, you know? I thought of food as fuel, primarily. But now, it's, it's bigger. Food represents a culture. Food represents a time. It represents an environment. 
It's the taste of its own land, you know, the, the terroir or the French word terroir. So when I am able to like think about things that's deeper than just like the nutritional aspects, but how it all came to be, that really, that, that changed my whole thinking process about food. The biggest thing I learned was to respect the ingredient. Like, and how do you do that, right? It's not like you, you worship an ingredient. You do it because when the ingredient comes in, you don't just take it and just throw it into a, in, you know, you, you handle it with care. Like if a fish comes in, and we spent X amount of dollars on it, it's not cheap. When the fish comes in, you, you don't lift it just by the tail. You grab it from the head and its tail, you know? Things like this, and you treat it with care. And you don't waste the ingredient. For example, the fish bones, you don't throw that away. You save that and you make a fish, uh, fish fume or a fish stock with it, you know? It's fucking wasting the most expensive part. Look at it. What are you gonna do, get daddy to buy you a new one? It's just, you know, you, you don't save this, you don't throw the skin out. You, uh, you dehydrate it and you fry it, you crisp it up and it becomes a garnish to the dish. Um, so it, it's that level of like care and thought, um, trying to extract as much as you can not just for the profit or the money part, but to like, to, so the ingredient doesn't go to waste, you know? So there isn't like, everyone's just excessively just like wasting ingredient. That's just not good for the planet. I'll turn you into a fucking tree. Captain Planet, motherfucker. Ramen spot I worked at for a year and a half. Um, and, and from then I went to a American, American restaurant called Michael's in Midtown. Um, and, the, and I was introduced to Michael's well, first of all, I was able to work at Michael's because by, towards the end of Ramen Setagaya, or, or yeah, towards the end of Ramen Setagaya, I got like a working, working, per, uh, uh, working permit. Basically, you know, I got, I got permission to work legally, you know? I got a tax ID, so I was able to get paychecks. So when Ramen Setagaya came towards an end and I, and I knew I wanted to go into, into this, uh, into the culinary world, like professionally, I had to change because um, ramen's great, but I wanted to diversify and learn new uh, new cuisines, new techniques. Um, so I went to Michael's uh, Michael's restaurant, and they've been around since 1989. So the same year I was born. They're a classic, established place uh, in Midtown. They, known for their amazing breakfast, uh, very busy lunch, and then great, huge like cocktail parties or uh, private private events um, done for like. Bankers, businessmen, all in uh, all in Midtown. Um, they were power. They were power lunch spot. I wanted to learn like the different techniques of like French techniques of like making a stock, a different stock, making a consomme, making you know, learning different cuts of that, using different produce and ingredients. Um, and you can only do that by working at a different restaurant. Um, and that's how I moved on to Michaels. After Michaels, I worked at Tabla. It was a Union Square hospitality restaurant. And it was the first restaurant I worked at where all the cooks in the kitchen had like clean, like chef, chef shirts, clean apron, like hats that were perfect. There was no yelling. Everyone was just working very hard. And like, I, I, I've never, I've only maybe, I actually, I've never even heard of, heard of working like that period. Cause I was always in like a loud kitchen environment, like kind of like roughing things up, like, but when I worked there and everyone like cared for ingredients, they're like, smallest things, like if there's like a piece of like scallion on the floor, they'll like pick it up. They'll sweep every 30 minutes. Like it was really intense. And I think that's when I realized, wait, there's like a standard to this. It's like, it doesn't matter about just the plate of food. It's what goes on in the kitchen, you know, how much people care and how much, and how people work together and how serious they are and how much they care. That, makes a huge difference in the final product. So I got the confidence to open up my own place last year when I started doing the pop-up. Um, so a few of the dishes made it here from the pop-up. Gr granted the pop-up menu was small because I was the only, I was, I was the dishwasher, the chef, the receiver, you know, everything. Um, like the burger made it here. Uh, our chopped cheese rice cakes made it here. Our chicken wings made it here. Um, so when I started the pop-up, um, I paid rent to, to, to rent out the kitchen space. So the deal was like this. I pay like X amount of money in rent. I pay a portion of the utility bills that come in every month. 
but I keep, I buy the food ingredients, right? I prep it, I sell the food, and the food revenue comes to me. So it was like a food stand at like a smorgasbord, except it's at a bar, right? So it's the first time I ever did like a small business for myself. And in the first month, I was, I was really slow. The bar was brand new, there was no PR. And I'm like, I'm the guy in the back, I'm like, wait, like, we need to make something happen. So I was, I lost thousands of dollars. I, I probably, I spent like five thousand dollars from the, from the get, to like, from the jump to like, buy plates, buy kitchen equipment, like cutting boards and all that stuff. I'm broke, baby. I ain't got no money. You know. And then the first month, my, I, I, I sold like three burgers a day. You know, that's not enough to even pay rent. Not even close. So before the pop up, I was the executive chef of a hotel, overseeing like uh, at Hotel Fifty Bowery. It was, it was fairly new. I opened it uh, as the executive chef, um, overseeing the restaurant, um, overseeing the hotel banquet parties, the food and beverage program um, for the, the rooftop bar. Um, it was a big space and I, I was executive chef there. And I worked there for almost two years and I, and I was turning 30. I was about to turn 30 and I made, and I decided, I'm like, all right, if I'm going to try to, if I'm gonna risk it to like open up my own place and try or try a pop-up thing, I have to do it now before I'm married and I have kids and I have too much on my shoulders to burn it. Because if I can fuck up now, it's not that big of a fuck up. I can bounce back. But if I fuck up when I have like two kids to feed, I've ruined it for the entire family and it's too much on my shoulders. I'm like, it's not good. So that's when I decided to quit and start doing pop-ups. So fast forward, I quit my job uh, February 15 of 2009. 19 right and I started this pop-up and then after a month of business we were so so slow losing so much money I sold my like Italian watch that I bought for like 10 grand I sold it for like five but like, like four grand because I needed I was like I need a little money to like help me get through um and then I started like uh with the help of my girlfriend Rebecca because uh, she's uh she's big in the social media world um it's not her nine to five job, but that's her passion, that her side thing that she really loves doing. And we just started hitting up every like, inviting every like big social media people, YouTube, like food celebrities. And then one day after a month or two, Gothamist came in randomly. I didn't even know. And the food writer for Gothamist came in and reviewed my food. He visited three times and tried the menu and and said on the title of the article was uh, random bar serving New York, one of New York City's greatest burger. And after that, it was, it was a wrap. I had like 200 people in line every single day just to eat a burger. It was insane. So the amount of like, I went from like zero to 100, you know? It was like the reverse of COVID. It was like, <laughs> you know, like selling like two burgers to like selling 200 is, I was not ready. It was a great problem to have, but it was insane. The number one dish was our dry aged steak burger um, that we served on uh, sesame seeded buns with American cheese and kimchi mayo. Yeah. That's it. That's it. It's and a dill pickle. Simple, but, yeah. simple. But, but, it's, but it's like, you take something so simple like a cheeseburger and you add something that's Korean without it like letting it overpower the flavors of beef, like high quality steak that's dry aged, people love it, you know? And then the second dish was a honey butter tater tots. So I thought of honey butter chips. Well, I wanted to serve French fries, but I'm like, wait, hold up. French fries, when you go to bars or restaurants, French fries are always different everywhere. They're never consistent. Sometimes they're soggy, sometimes they're crispy. Potatoes actually, they're, um, they change with season two. So it's not like you can get the same fries if you're making it yourself throughout the season, you know? Um, but tater tots that I buy, I'm like, yo, tater, I've never had bad tater tots. They're always like consistent, right? So I'm like, all right, I wanna do tater tots. It's at a bar, I need to do tater tots. Um, but, I, but I can't just serve tots when like ketchup, right? Cause that's, I could, but it's not, there's no Korean touch to it. So I, so I thought of, um, Honey butter because honey butter potato chips, they're made out of potato. I'm like, why not honey butter tater tots? But I'll serve it with the sauce that kind of like offsets and balances out the sweetness of the honey butter. 
and then I'll add like some seaweed to it, right? Or something like that. That's how I came up with the honey butter tater tots. We had some other dishes as well. Um, another dish that I mentioned was the Shin Ramen Chicken Wings, where I incorporated all of a Shin Ramen pack into the chicken wing. Even to the, to the dried vegetable packet, I incorporated all of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I mean, cause I, cause I was doing a pop-up at a bar and I, and it's always about adapting and serving. I'm not gonna go there and serve like kimchi jjigae, right? It wouldn't work. So I'm like, okay, it's a Japanese inspired bar. I wanna do some, some Korean inspired bar food and then serve it here with a touch of Japanese ingredients here and there. Um, but that's what I did. So when I think of an American bar, I always think of three things, a burger, tots, and wings. That's like three things that I always order at an American bar. So my, my goal was to create those three dishes, but do it in a really cool, like, uh, untraditional, non-traditional way. So being told that I'm serving one of New York City's uh, greatest burger, one of New York City's greatest burger, is the biggest compliment. And I'm like, I'm humbled by it. I, I really don't think I am. Honestly, my, my favorite growing up was Big Mac, you know what I mean? Um, but, but also like, you know, like for, for, for someone to hear that, uh, for someone to say that makes me feel like definitely validated because I know how much work I put in. I worked so hard and to be, to be told something like that, a big compliment. It was so, I was so happy to hear it. I competed on CHOP. I filmed the episode my first month of doing the pop-up. Do I like to be seen? I love to be seen, you know? Um, I, I never, I never got like, shy in front of a camera and I never like shied away from the spotlight I was like I was a class clown growing up um, I love the tension as the, I'm the oldest child when, when, when my younger brother came came out of my mom's room I'm like yo you better not steal the spotlight from me bro I'll fuck you up <laughs> I will fuck you up I don't know I just I was just never like a shy person you know so being in front of a camera just felt natural and I perform well under pressure. So I think it just made sense. That was the first time at the pop-up where, well, first time in my career where I got validation and like got like really complimented. Um, and it felt great. Um, and then all the other media started featuring me as well. Grub Street, New York Mag, Thrillist, uh, Eater. Um, all these like publications, they started just flocking in, and um, and I just I just kept getting more and more popular ever since. And then I did that for it was a six month agreement that I made prior. I honored the six month agreement um, during my stay at, at the pop up. A real estate agent came in randomly, and he ate the burger. He's like, "Yo, like, are you thinking about opening a restaurant?" I was like, oh, I, 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 "I'm thinking about it. I just." haven't actively looked and he, he's like, all right, I'm gonna come back next week. Um, I'm gonna find you your space. And then he came back next week. And I'm like, whatever, man. Like he dropped off like a manila folder with two, with two things like, I'm gonna find you your space. I'm like, all right, man. Like, but you know, I'm like, whatever, man. Like you're just trying to like make money, right? And then like a month after that, he calls me or he texts me, he's like, hey, I I think I found your spot. I'm like, it's like, you gotta come and see it. I'm like, but at this time I'm living in Brooklyn. I'm like, dude, I'm not gonna come just to look at a spot. Like you gotta send me the details first. He's like, all right, all right, all right. It's like, we don't have much time because this just came on the market. No, it's not, no one has seen it yet. I, I, we're the first like real estate company to get it. And I, I, I don't wanna put it online. So he sent me the details. He's like, hey, this is 750 square feet. It's fully built out. There's a full kitchen. There's a basement with a walk-in freezer, walk-in fridge. There's everything's here. You just gotta come and just, just take over. So, so I'm like, all right. So I came in and looked at it, and I'm like, wow, like this is. I think I could do something here. And then I called him. My dad um, came in the following week. He looked at it with me, just kind of like checked every every place and made sure it looked in decent condition. And then that was it. We negotiated. It took two months to negotiate, and then signed the lease. I think. Everything was just happening so organically and naturally. It didn't feel like I was fighting a current, you know? Everything was just like being placed the way, um, and I never like forced my way into anything. It just kind of happened. So like, it's definitely like a way like the universe is working, right? Like, um, like this really had nothing to do with, it just felt like it was my time, you know? After the years I put in like working, um, 
the commitment I made and it's just being laid out as a plan. And I just, I'm just riding the wave, that's it. You know, there's so many people in the world, right, that have the greatest ideas, you know, but that courage to make that first step, that's the most important step, right? Because um, cause that comes with the big risk, you know, because you're so vulnerable. You're like, if I quit this cushy six-figure job with like full health benefits and I'm leaving all this behind, to now I'm not gonna take a paycheck, but I'm gonna rely and pay rent and try to make this pop-up survive. And I'm not gonna have any, I might not have any um, income coming for the next few months. Like, would someone be okay with that? You know what I mean? That's a, such a big, that's such a big step, you know? So I think doing that and like going through the, the hardship and like fighting through it, fighting through the slow times and like reaching out to people and then organically the media coming and loving it, just that definitely gave me the confidence. Cooking's a sacrifice. Like working in this industry is a sacrifice for, for like, you know, I never worked as a front of the house uh, employee, but for the back of the house, it's a sacrifice because you don't, you just rely on the hourly pay and you bank on the overtime. You're like, you're hoping that you get at least five or six hours overtime every week to like make that extra money to help you get through. But you, no one ever cooks because like you want to make money. You know, you cook because this is like, you feel like it's your calling. You, you absolutely enjoy cooking and you're risking it now. You're going through the, the you're sacrificing your time now so that hopefully later on when you become an executive chef at, a, at another like another restaurant or a big restaurant, you can make decent salary there. That's what you're hoping. So you have to sacrifice your way to get there. So that's, for me, it was always a sacrifice. At, at the end of the day, when, when customers and guests or guests, they come into no one, they eat, they have a great time and they leave. That means like to me, that's like hospitality, right? Like I think of like inviting someone over to my house Hey, come on in. I'm gonna. I'll cook you dinner. I'll make some drinks for you, and um, they leave happy. They're like, "Oh, you were such a great host. Thanks so much." You know, that it's kind of like that feeling, except they're they're actually paying and they're supporting you. But to give them the absolute best service, to check up on them, and you know, make sure they have everything they need and they feel happy, and the food's delicious and the drinks are delicious. You know, and, they, and for them to say, "I'm gonna come back again next week," and they show up with more friends and they bring a different group of friends every time they come, that's the best feeling, you know? I mean, so behind me, that's my grandfather. But in the figure of uh, Admiral Yi uh, Sung-shin, um, so he played a big role in my family. Um, he passed away when I was six or seven, but uh, he was the Marine General in Korea, uh, and he was like the strict enforcer and he like uh, really led the family through the hardship, you know, um, sacrificing himself for the good of the country. So he played a big role and uh, my, my, my dad always spoke very, very highly of him. And um, I wanted to just honor, honor him, you know, honor the family and like really represents no one because um, it's not, it's not just about me, right? I'm not, I'm not here just to represent myself. Um, it's like, it's bigger than me. I'm nobody, you know, it's bigger than me. It's about this culture. It's about my family. It's about us making a mark, uh, you know, the American dream, right? Um, it was a family effort to build this restaurant. It's, fa it's family funded. I'm 100% owner. Um, I don't have like investors or partners. This is just me. Um, you know, the, mer the merch design done by my brother, business cards designed by my brother. The tables that are the tabletops made from scratch by my dad. My dad painted, he fixed all the little things. So it's about just like honoring my family and like and, and the upbringing of a Asian American or Korean American. My name is Jay Lee, Korean American, chef and owner of No One in East Village. You're peeping into Shoes Off.